Our next bill is the Hospital Quality Assurance Fee, AB 1607. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The Hospital Quality Assurance Fee Trailer Bill includes provisions to extend the sunset of the fee and uh, makes the Hospital Quality Assurance Revenue Fund continuously appropriated. The bill extends the uh, Quality Assurance Fee sun Sunset excuse me, from January 1st, 2017 to January 1st, 2018. This measure does require a two-thirds vote of the legislature. The bill results in approximately $845 million in general fund savings to the state in 2017-18 and provides approximately $4 billion to hospitals. We're happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Costa. Questions from the committee? Any public comment? Chairman and members, Barbara Glazer with the California Hospital Association here today in support of the bill. This bill will assure us that we won't have a gap in that hospital fee funding. Thank you for your support. Thank you, Ms. Glazer. I'll move the bill. Okay, we have both motions from Senator Roth and Senator Nielsen. Again, this is just to cover us for the next year. Call the roll, please. The motion is due pass. Leno? Aye. Nielsen? Aye. Allen? Aye. Anderson? Bell? Block? Glazer? Aye. Hancock? Aye. Mitchell? Aye. Monning? Aye. Morlock? Aye. Wynn? No. Pan? Aye. Pavley? Roth, Stone, and Wolk. Anderson, no. Okay, the vote has 11 to 2, and again, we will keep that open. So as we did with AB 1603, we're going to skip over 1609. There was again a technical problem with that bill, so it was submitted a little bit later. We'll move on to AB 1615, our first of two public safety bills. Thank you, Mr. Chair. AB 1615 is one of the public safety trailer bills and it includes various statutory changes such as creating the Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion or LEAD pilot program. It establishes community infrastructure grants to promote local diversion programs and services, uh, as well as it revises the composition of the Juvenile Parole Board and the Board of Parole Hearings. It also extends the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, Rehabilitation's authority to contract for additional housing until January 1st of 2020. Thank you, Ms. Costa. Colleagues, any questions from the committee? So just one thing I wanted to point out, and if you or your staff can give us any additional information on this, be happy to accept it. We had heard from a number of counties that there was need beyond funds for jail construction in the form of mental health service facilities or addiction treatment facilities to deal with a similar population that might, if left untreated, find its way into our criminal justice system. So this is the community infrastructure grants and uh, we'll create a grant program operated through the California Health Facilities Financing Authority. Can you, this is uh, some, something new for us. Can you share a little bit more? Certainly, uh, the budget includes $67.5 million general fund for one-time community infrastructure grants, um, as you stated, Mr. Chair, to promote diversion programs and services by increasing the number of mental health, substance use disorder, and trauma-related services facilities. Grants will be awarded through the California Healthcare Finance Facilities Financing Authority on a competitive basis to cities and counties or counties acting jointly for the purpose of expanding local resources for facility acquisition or renovation, equipment purpose, and applicable program startup or expansion costs to increase the availability and capacity of these programs. So different from a local jail, of course, uh, which would be a locked facility, this could afford treatments, but in a non-locked facility. That's correct, Mr. Chair. Right. So I put this in our win column for us. It's not as much money as I would have hoped, but it's certainly a good step forward. And just want to recognize Senator Hancock's 
leadership on the law enforcement assisted diversion project. We had long hearings in your policy committee to look at the success of this model and I think it was in Seattle, correct? Yes. Yes. So again, a big uh, opportunity for us there to divert folks who might otherwise make their way into our criminal justice system. Any other questions from the committee? We had, yes, Senator Roth? No, it's, 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 Senator Nelson. Mr. Chairman, I, it's, a, it's an item of some soreness to me. We make budget agreements in past years and then they get reneged in future years and there's contained herein uh, a budget agreement from uh, 2009 that uh, was a temporary that's now made permanent and those are kind of sore points with me that we make hard rot uh, budget agreements and then we tend to in later years forget them and uh, there's also a uh, a temporary fee increase uh, another temporary fee increase that's made permanent by this one Maybe small items, but small items uh, get built in and become permanent. I, I have some concerns about that. As always, well stated. That's all. That's all enough. right. We have a motion by Senator Roth, which will hold until we hear from public comment. Mr. Chair and members, Khalif Fasigai on behalf of the California Public Defenders Association, we're here to express our strong opposition to the trailer bill language relating to the reduction in peremptory challenges from 10 to 6. We have been battling this reduction for years, first in policy committees, and we were able to get SB 213 held in the assembly that was currently being considered and negotiated for a reduction in peremptory challenges. Then we see this language inserted into the budget bill at the last minute under the title access to justice, where in which it will in fact do is reduce access to justice because by reducing peremptory challenges, we're going to negatively impact the ability for, defending, for defense counsel to select fair juries. Six is too low of a number. We need to be doing this in policy committee where we can consider all sides of what, this, of what impact this change will have in the judiciary. Expedience is required in the judiciary only to give a fair trial and a speedy trial to the defendant, not to decrease the rights of the defendant based on the expedience of the court. And for that reason, we would urge you to reject the trailer bill language that deals with the production and peremptory challenges that's contained in AB 1615. Thank you, Mr. Guy. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members, Ignacio Hernandez on behalf of the California Attorneys for Criminal Justice. We are a statewide association of criminal defense attorneys, and uh, as you heard from prior witness, our colleague, our sister organization, we too st stand strongly opposed to this trailer bill language. He already discussed the process in which this occurred, and let me just mention a couple of things. One, uh, the adverse impact on low-income individuals and people of color, color is going to be extraordinary. We know that the voters of California adopted Prop 47 because of, in part because of the disproportionate number of people of color who are being charged with possession of drugs, felony possession of drugs. Each and every one of those individuals is now going to be charged with a misdemeanor. So the disproportionate impact of drug possession is now moving from felonies to misdemeanors. And now the folks that I represent and that when I was an attorney, when we were in, when we're in court trying to defend these individuals, You've now reduced our peremptory challenges by 40% from 10 to six. And when we have defendants who are people of color, who speak with an accent, who look different, perhaps need an interpreter when they are there in court, it is much more challenging to get a fair jury and jurors who are going to look at them and actually presume that they are innocent until proven guilty when we do not have these peremptory challenges. On the fiscal impact, there is virtually none. The, there is a claim by the Judges Association that this will somehow save time in court. And let me tell you this, if it does, then logic is thrown out the window, and here's why. They claim that this is, there'll be less time in, in jury void dear. Well, the judges are in control of jury void dear. They set the time limit of how many questions defense attorneys can ask, and they usually give us about 15 minutes for an entire jury pool. That's it. After this is signed, we will still have 15 minutes to ask questions, but we will have fewer peremptory challenges to use to try to remove folks who appear to be biased. 
So it's not going to save any time. And if it is, it's nominal. And in fact, it will take more time because now we're going to have to try to convince judges to challenge someone for cause, which we have a right to ask the judge to examine a potential juror for cause and get him kicked off. So now we're just going to shift our time from arguing over peremptories to arguing over challenges. So we're not going to save time. And lastly, this. In testimony in support of this bill, I heard judges talk about how jammed they are in their courtrooms, how they have full calendars, and how this is somehow going to help. And this, in fact, they said it will help them deal with felony trials if they had less time on misdemeanors. Well, first of all, I deplore the idea that we need fast food justice with misdemeanors. They need just as much time as they need. Second of all, the only scoring of savings is that they will call fewer jurors. Well, you know what that means? That means that with fewer peremptories, the number of the jury pool is still the same number. They should still call the same number. And the ones that are not called into the into the courtroom should be used for felony trials in the way that they claim that's what they're going to do. Instead, they're not going to shift these jurors to other cases to reduce the caseload. They're simply not going to call them. So what does that mean? That means they can leave at 3 o'clock instead of leaving at maybe 3.30. There is no upside to this proposal. None. There's no fiscal upside. There's no policy upside. And it's all going to be an adverse impact on those individuals who all of you agree deserve their day in court and they deserve full due process and full protection and full confidence that if they are convicted of a misdemeanor, they had a fair jury and a fair trial. I need to correct something that I have been telling folks. I have been telling folks that the number of misdemeanors is relatively low in, in California. That is true. I was quoting in Sacramento County that the number is around 10 a month, 10 jury trials, misdemeanor jury trials a month to demonstrate just how such a low number this really is. And it's not going to score savings. I misspoke. It is not 10 a month. It is approximately 29 a year. So about two to three a month in Sacramento County. And I have the latest statistics from Judicial Council. There are only three or four counties that are over 100 a year. So this is relatively little savings for the state, if any, but huge impact on every individual who walks into court on trial for a crime they fully believe they did not commit, otherwise they would not go to trial. They may be facing sex, mandatory sex offender registration. They may be looking at losing their job if they're convicted, which is why they fight it for a number of reasons. Thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Chair, and I really hope we can reconsider this. Thank you, Mr. Hernandez. Anyone else on our public safety trailer bill? Sean Hoffman with the California District Attorneys Association. I wanted to speak on the uh, peremptory challenge issue. We are ultimately neutral on this piece with the addition of the sunset and the study. Um, but we did want to convey our disappointment in handling this issue through the budget process rather than through the normal legislative process when there is a bill already in the second house on which there have been a number of conversations between stakeholders trying to uh, work those issues out. We have significant concerns about an immediate implementation date rather than having some time to prepare for this where you could have a trial that starts at 10 a.m. with 10 peremptories. The governor signs this at 10.30 and a trial starting at 11 and now has six. Uh, you know, that's, that's a difficult contingency for our folks to prepare for. Um, so wanted to put those concerns on the record. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Hoffman. Thank you for the impassioned comments, and I let the comments move uh, along as I did only because this will be a last opportunity for anyone to comment. And of course, the issue is decided in conference committee where we don't have public comments. So I thought it appropriate that the public could speak on this. And I'm going to call on Senator Block in just a moment because uh, he had a bill that moved through our house, uh, a policy bill on this issue. Uh, there, It is currently in the assembly and some negotiations around it are ongoing. Uh, and for those of you who weren't in conference the other night, just give you a little bit more background information. So uh, this issue, which clearly is a policy matter, but uh, depending upon who you're talking to, may or may not have some fiscal impact as well, which is why it's before us, had been presented in the governor's January budget. If I remember correctly, our side did not take it up and it was defeated in the budget subcommittee on the assembly side. 
It was brought up again in the negotiations uh, between our leaders and the administration, and it was agreed upon that we would move forward with reducing the peremptory challenges from 10 to 7. Uh, when that came to my attention, just the last night of conference, uh, it was of concern to me. It was the lone vote against Senator Block's bill on the floor of the Senate. Uh, but not that notwithstanding, uh, it just seemed um, especially challenging because we were facing it on the last night of conference. But it was a part of the budget agreement, and I had to be true to that. Uh, recognizing what was before us, the reduction from 10 to 7, after issuing my concern, uh, the administration did come back and say, well, we could set a sunset of January 1st, 2021, but then we're going to drop it to 6. And the conference committee thought that was better than no sunset at all at 7. So that's where we went and that's how it unfolded. Uh, and as you noticed, uh, District Attorneys Association, along with the public defenders, had uh, concerns about this. Uh, I just wanted to uh, ask uh, Ms. Costa, since it was brought up by Mr. Hoffman, uh, recognizing all the concern about this and the relative, if not dramatic, change it will cause in the courtroom, might there be any opportunity to at least afford, in preparation of the change, an uh, implementation date of January 1st as opposed to when the budget is signed. And I just ask if that's even a possibility. And I don't know that you can speak on behalf of the governor at this point, but I thought since it's been asked and it seemed like a reasonable request, I would at least put it out there. Yeah, right. Of course, now it's on, sorry, uh, technical difficulties. Uh, you know, I think, and, and we certainly had a spirited yes, discussion <laughs> about this in conference committee, Mr. Chair, you and I. And, and I. and I would just know, as far as the process is concerned, I want to make it very clear, this has been in the governor's budget proposal since January. So the characterization that somehow, you know, this popped up or was snuck in, I think is really is a mischaracterization of this particular issue. And I do believe that this represents a true conference compromise in which we talked about the number of peremptory challenges as well as a sunset and a report um, due back to the legislature on this very, you know, policy change to see whether or not it's warranted and what the impacts were. And we still believe this is an incremental and appropriate change. Um, I would note that, um, and I know Senator Block will speak on it, um, this proposal is very similar to legislation that was moved by Senator Block. Um, it was passed uh, in the Senate Policy Committee. It was passed off the Senate floor uh, with one no vote, which I believe was yours, Mr. Chair, and several members not voting. Um, but certainly this body has heard this policy and voted affirmatively for it. Senator Block. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank the governor for doing the right thing. Um, you know, when, when the witnesses came up and at least one of them mischaracterized this as being suddenly thrust upon you, knowing full well that this was a bill that had been heard by this body, both, both the full Senate and the policy committee in the Senate, and knowing full well, I assume, that the governor proposed this back in January. I, I just have to say that wasn't the only mischaracterization by uh, that member of the public who testified. He also talks about the, the reduction in peremptory challenges as being potentially a tool for, um, for attorneys using, district attorneys, I would assume he's trying to say, using um, peremptories or the, the reduction of peremptories to get um, more racially biased juries. Actually, most jurists, and, and there are law review articles about this, say that it's the number of peremptory challenges that are often used to get racially biased juries because you, you take people off of juries because of their race, because you have a peremptory challenge. You still have unlimited challenges for cause, and challenges for cause can be used to make sure there is not a racially biased jury. It's the peremptory challenges that are a problem. That's why all 58 
of the presiding judges in the 58 counties that we represent in the state of California support this. The judges all support this. And that's why you all voted for this 34 to 1. If this sounds familiar to you, it's because you considered it. If you're on public safety, you considered it there and passed it. If you were on in just on the floor of the day, 34 out of the 40 of us voted yes. One person voted no. I'm not sure how many were absent or chose not to vote. So, you know, this is certainly not something to hold up the budget over. It's been adopted now by the conference committee. Both houses and the governor have reached a compromise on this. So I ask that we move forward. Mr. Chair, if I may, yes, uh, course, to, your, uh, to your earlier comment, um, the administration will be happy to work with the legislature on um, creating an enactment date in January to the point of trials that are already underway and there being a hardship um, to comply with this new law. We'd be happy to work with committee staff to phase that in um, to avoid implementation challenges. That's very generous and gracious and I appreciate that. Um, yes, we do have a motion and if there is no other comment or question from the committee, we will call the vote. And just to reiterate, uh, yes, it was noted, I voted no on the floor. Uh, I voted yes in committee, conference committee. I will be voting yes today. Uh, this is keeping our leadership's word on the greater budget deal uh, honorable, and that's why I'm voting aye. AB 1615, the motion is due pass. Leno? Aye. Nielsen? No. Allen? Aye. Anderson? No. Bell? Block? Aye. Glazer? Aye. Hancock? Aye. Mitchell? Aye. Monning? Aye. Morlock? Wynn? Pan? Aye. Pavley? Roth? Aye. Stone? Aye. Wolk? Aye. All right. The vote on 1615 is 10 to 4, and we will keep the roll open. Moving on to AB 16, 16, which is our second public safety bill, trailer bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, this is our second public safety uh, trailer bill, AB 1616. Uh, this bill appropriates $270 million in lease revenue bond authority for competitive grants to counties that have previously received only a partial award or who have never received an award for the state, from the state, excuse me, for replacing or renovating county jails to improve custodial housing, reentry, rehabilitative programming, mental health services, or treatment space. Of this amount that we're appropriating in this item, $20 million is set aside uh, for Napa to replace its jail that was damaged in the 2014 earthquake. Thank you, Ms. Costa. Committee members, any comments? Yes, Senator Morlock. With the lease revenue bond, where's the revenue coming from? Uh, Chris Leaf's Department of Finance. Uh, the lease revenue, uh, the revenue is the rent that's paid for the jail facility through a uh, series of lease arrangements between the state and the county. I'm sorry, we can't hear you. Oh. Uh, the, the revenue is from rent paid for the jail facility through a series of lease arrangements between the county and the state. So you have a proposal to give grants to build new jails. So you're going to have a competition for these funds? Or am I, ta am I talking about it? I think it was AB 900 from many moons ago. Is it the same thing? Josh Gogger, Department of Finance. So yes, it's a, aside from the 20 million set aside for Napa, it would be a similar to the prior uh, rounds of funding that would be a competitive grant where counties can apply. Um, and it's set up into uh, different tiers depending on the size of the county. So then Napa County gets 20 million and then they pay rent? The, the state actually pays the rent for the facility. Okay. Okay, so then we have to budget that rent in the future then. That's a, it's like an, another interest expense that we have to rely on either cutting something or getting more revenues in the future to pay for that. That is a general fund expense. I know it's really basic, but I'm just trying to make sure. I, so it's like any other bond. If we 
issue debt, we're gonna have to pay for it. And that's, so, so we're creating a, a, a rental income by paying it ourselves and that avoids having to get the voters to vote for this. Right. Very creative, I just. Okay, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Glazer. We do have a motion and not uh, necessarily justifying our history here, but just recounting it. Uh, going back to AB 900, uh, I think we've expended about $2.2 billion in lease revenue bonds over the past 10 years or so for county jail construction. That's correct. Between the first and second phase of AB 900, SB 1022, and SB uh, 863, it's uh, approximately 2.2 billion. So, Senator Morlock, my understanding is that of our 58 counties, there are still about 19, is it, which have not yet had access to either any of the 2.2 billion in former lease revenue bonds for jail construction or the most recent round. And so that this 250 is directed toward them. No other county could double dip before one of the other 19 has I, its I would opportunity. just clarify of the 19, some have never applied, some have received partial awards. Um, so it's a mix within the 19. And just to provide a little bit more history about this particular one is the governor did put forward a proposal to pay for this with general funds as part of the conference compromise. We've brought before you a lease revenue payment for these um, and some of the previous items in the past public safety trailer bill um, in which the legislature's intent was to focus more on rehabilitative services and um, you know uh, trauma um, prevention and crisis uh, services were funded and so it represents a compromise. So Ms. Costa is right about that. The January budget proposed 250 million general fund dollars for this purpose. The conference compromise was to use lease re revenue bonds in the same amount which then freed up some general fund monies for potentially other purposes, including the community infrastructure grants, which we just had in the prior bill, which will be one-time general fund money for the construction or expansion of alternative services for those who might find their way into our criminal justice system for addiction services, mental health services, uh, and trauma victims. So that's how we got here. We do have a motion by Senator Glazer. Do we have any public comment? Please call the roll. AB 1616, the motion is due pass. Leno? Aye. Nielsen? Aye. Allen? Aye. Anderson? Aye. Bell? Anderson. Bell? Block? Aye. Glazer? Aye. Hancock? Aye. Mitchell? Aye. Monning? Aye. Morlock? No. Wynn? Aye. Pan? Aye. Pavley? Aye. Roth? Aye. Stone? Walk. The vote on the motion is 12 to 2, and we will keep it open. Excuse me, Mr. Chair, that I thought I, I heard three no's. I'm sorry. The three no's would be Morlock, Anderson, and Stone. So noted.